Excuse me, little dog. My guys. Well, it is an exciting Saturday night here in the collapse of everything here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Saturday night, August 17th, 2024. And since I am a doomer and do not have a life, uh, instead of getting out there and enjoying it while I still can, what am I doing here on this Saturday night? I am reading this long, involved paper about the United Nations. <clears throat> uh, the United Nations, you know, I have always been a little bit confused about the UN and particularly this dude, Antonio Guterres and stuff. I, I, I mean, I, I've just always assumed it, it's just been a hunch, just kind of a hunch that the United Nations is the single biggest collection of planet eaters uh, th this side of Caterpillar Corporation. You know, obviously everything about the United Nations is anathema to life on planet Earth. And uh, I'm just uh, always just assumed they are the most pro-growth, you know, economic growth, population growth, pro-natalist uh, group of, uh, of just, who are these people? Uh, you know, and, and, and these right-wing conspirators, you know, talking about the United Nations being... Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the big architects of the New World Order depopulation agenda. Mm -hmm. The United Nations leading a depopulation agenda. The United Nations <clears throat> is leading an overpopulation agenda. But anyway, guys, I mean, you know, I have to admit a little bit that I've never really studied the UN. I've just Whenever I hear them, my little doomer bullshit detector comes up. So uh, three or four people on the planet uh, might have stuck to the end of my uh, ain't gonna happen roundup rant where uh, I was just getting ready to uh, close with this quote from a paper about the United Nations when my camera collapsed. And I'm kind of just, I, I, I'm kind of glad it did, but we will uh, talk about that in a while. But this is what I was gonna read to close out my ain't gonna happen roundup rant. And then I was just gonna laugh it off and head off. So this is the very last sentence uh, in this paper, the closing paragraph. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. The dynamic stability and vitality of Earth's ecosystems and all its inhabitants demand a major reorientation of the human imagination to respond soberly to mounting social and ecological crises. We must face the truth by grounding ourselves, you know, humans, by grounding ourselves in humility, relinquishing planetary domination uh, isn't there something in Genesis about dominion? Uh, relinquishing planetary domination, shrinking human presence and activities, and spurring into action to reinstate kin-centric relations 
with the planet and its entire community of life to move beyond the failed approaches of our current politics requires us, humans, to abandon the incessant pursuit of growth and to embrace a sense of our shared humanity embedded within the larger web of life. We urge, we urge the United Nations to help lead the way. Yes, and that was how I was going to close. Uh, the ain't gonna happen uh, roundup. So I actually found this paper in medium.com. Eric Lee uh, shared this paper by, I don't know who these people are, Nandita Bajaj, Eileen Christ, and Kirsten Stade, uh, titled Confronting the United Nations Pro-Growth Agenda, a Call to Reverse Ecological Overshoot. So, uh, I am... Uh, I'm gonna. I'm hoping this is a link to take you on to this long paper on uh, on this. And so, guys, I, I I fully understand. All right, I fully understand that it ain't gonna happen. What these ladies are talking about, these doomer chicks here are talking about. There, the the United Nations are the the last people to lead. The, the world, you know, away from ecological overshoot. They are one of the, the main architects of ecological overshoot on the planet. The last thing the United Nations is going to do is confront overshoot, uh, meaning both overpopulation and overconsumption. I don't give a shit how much of a doomer that, that guy, Antonio Guterres, uh, you know, talking all of that shit, uh, you will never hear the word overshoot or overpopulation come out of Antonio Guterres's mouth. I would be surprised if the word overshoot has ever appeared in an IPCC document one time in history. So anyway, I, I'm, I, I'm not kidding myself that it ain't going to happen. And so what the what these women do uh, in urging the UN to uh, just basically do everything it's programmed in its DNA not to do, it really does this paper. Well, what it does is detail in a very well written paper and a lot of it is based on the research of William Reese, which I really uh, like about it. They, they quote William Reese frequently in this article. It, 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 this entire article spells out why the United Nations, the last thing the United Nations is ever going to do is reverse ecological overshoot. Uh, the, the United Nations primary goal is to take the planet deeper and deeper into ecological overshoot. But anyway, uh, there is some good information and I encourage you to read it. Uh, and it's... Uh, so they have a lot about overshoot, but I'm going to, I, I might come back. I mean, there's a lot I want that I, I could actually uh, make a couple of rants out of this, but I am going to, uh, just because I know that not many people stay very long with uh, videos, I am, uh, I'm going to jump ahead oh, and, and pat and, and, uh, gloss over all of this excellent information about overshoot and we're going to talk about the United Nations 
stand on uh, overpopulation. Okay, and maybe I'll come back and read the beginning here at the end. But anyway, <clears throat> the UN's early population efforts, early in the UN's history, the institution embraced the necessity of addressing population and played a pivotal role in focusing international attention in rights-based efforts to lower fertility. In the years following the UN's creation in 1945, demographic studies elucidated the realities of unprecedented population growth that were undermining efforts at peacekeeping and instituting an at peacekeeping and instituting human rights. And remember, this is back when the population was less than one-third of what it is today. In collaboration with the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, the UN convened its first world population conferences in 1954 in Rome and 1965 in Belgrade to discuss solutions to challenges related to population growth. As I say, when the population was what one third of what it was today. What followed was an extraordinary period of international investment and rights-based programs, including education for women and girls, and publicly funded family planning programs. These approaches brought tremendous gains in lowered fertility, reduced poverty, and enhanced autonomy for women and girls. And then they cite all of this stuff. Uh, but then we ran into a problem. Uh, the UN's 1994 Cairo conference uh, is when population concerns were abandoned. So what happened between uh, 1965 and 1994? Yet in the population conferences held in the decades that followed, namely 1974, in Bucharest in 1984 in Mexico City, this spirit of frankly acknowledging and addressing population challenges began to shift. By the 1990s, the subject, you know, of, uh, and they're not even using the word overpopulation, they're just talking about population. The subject had become so contentious that the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, Egypt, culminated with an abrupt departure from acknowledging the role of population deceleration in promoting ecological sustainability and human rights. Feminist and social justice advocates. Feminist and social justice advocates, religious conservatives, and trade and economic interest united, united to delegitimize population concerns brought forth by demographers, family planning advocates, and environmentalists at the Cairo conference. So how many times, guys, have you seen feminist social justice warriors, religious conservatives, and trade and economic interest all in bed together to gang up on one subject? Uh, this is everybody from the lefties to the right wingers to the religious nuts to the global corporatocracy, nobody wants to hear it, and it was officially abandoned. 
uh, as a subject of discussion in 1994. The uh, United Nations is the most pronatalist, uh, you know, grow, baby, grow uh, group of population boosters this side of Elon Musk. I don't know why they don't put Elon Musk up there uh, telling everyone to have 10 babies to save the planet. Uh, anyway, where were we? <clears throat> A key factor in this ideological turn was the ascension of the new right in the United States as the Reagan administration conjoined neoliberal economics and social religious conservatism and, and still, you know, with those feminist and social justice warriors cheering uh, on this one subject, buttressed by the conviction that human population increase was necessary for economic growth, the powerful proponents of this emerging ideology rejected state-level protectionist and welfare support, including for family planning initiatives that they branded Neo-Malthusian. Yes, Neo-Malthusian. In their formulation, opening markets for trade would itself lower fertility as it propelled development with no need for direct investment in family planning. Uh, I, I, I would have to break that sentence down a little bit. I'm a little unclear what that's referring to. Anyway, professed concern for the vulnerable notwithstanding, the motive for shifting toward a free trade emphasis was the drive by elites in both the developing and developed world to exploit developing nations' cheap resources. And then, of course, we can't forget the Pope. The presence of the Vatican and other conservative religious interests at Cairo and their vociferous opposition to birth control and abortion cemented the shift away from voluntary family planning policies and female empowerment as pathways to reduced fertility rates, higher quality of life, and nature protection. <clears throat> Ultimately, due to the presence of a constellation of interests that were for their own reasons hostile to family planning, the Cairo conference became the death knell for understanding that a sustainable population and the elevation of human rights could be twin goals for achieving reproductive and ecological justice. Feminist, feminist concern by institutions instances of population control efforts that had included coercive measures joined, joined trade and religious advocates in upholding this newfangled population denialism despite the fact that the vast majority of family planning initiatives over preceding decades were voluntarily, or voluntary and indisputably elevated women's reproductive rights and improved the quality of life. So what were the aftermath of the UN's 1994 Cairo conference? The consequences have been devastating. In the decades since the 1994 30 years ago now, Cairo Conference, international funding for family planning plummeted by 35%, and it continues to fall far short 
of the global unmet need for contraception, the result has been the stalling or even reversal of fertility declines in many countries now experiencing rapid population growth. What the reproductive rights community, including many feminists, missed in the historical moment was the enormous sway of pronatalism, a coercive population growth factor far more prevalent than any population control measures employed to lower fertility. You know, can you say, uh, can, can you say uh, Elon Musk, can you say Kamala Harris uh, wanting to pay uh, every breeder in the United States $6,000 of taxpayers' money uh, to have a baby? Uh, pronatalism. Pronatalism is a constellation of patriarchal, religious, nationalistic, and economic pressures on women to bear children precisely in order to strengthen those power structures. Pronatalism emerged as institutionalized patriarchy came to prevail with the rise some 5,000 years ago of early states and empires that depended on population expansion and seizure of resources to consolidate power. And nothing has changed here in the American empire. It, meaning pronatalism, remains enormously pervasive and oppressive in the lives of girls and women and continues to be the steadfast engine of population growth. Well, who do you think the biggest pronatalist uh, group on the planet is? It's the goddamn United Nations. With the ideological turn, turn away from population concerns instigated three decades ago, pronatalism has been allowed to thrive in the obfuscation spawned by a superficial view of human and reproductive rights. The emergent discourse about family planning privileged the ostensible right of parents to procreate, overlooking both the socio-cultural coercive pressures on girls and women to bear children and the rights of children to be born into social and ecological conditions that are conducive to their well-being. Additionally, the abandonment of the population factor meant that its undeniable relevance to safeguarding the natural world and future generations went missing from the public domain and international policy. So, uh, what is going on with the UN and population denial today? Let's look at the 2023 State of World Population Report. To this day, the ties of population size and growth to ecological and human well-being remain a largely proscribed subject within the UN as reflected in the 2023 State of World Population Report uh, by the United Nations Population Fund. The report demonstrates how the agency's extreme reluctance to addressing the population factor has resulted in messaging that excludes the impact of demographic realities on women, girls, ecosystems, and vulnerable 
uh, communities. Its glib title, Eight Billion Lives, Infinite Possibilities, suggests a strong disinclination for a nuanced discussion of the challenges posed by population growth. The report dismisses numerous studies by reputable scientists that draw conclusive links between the growth in human numbers and climate breakdown, biodiversity loss, species extinctions, resource scarcity, conflict, poverty, food insecurity, and more, labeling those studies modern Malthusianism, a term popularized by the pro-growth and religious right movement of the 1980s, instead of conceding the obvious role of human numbers in these compounding crises and the environmental and social benefits that would accrue from fewer people, the report vaguely alludes to, quote, reducing emissions and increasing sustainable production and consumption as strategies to address climate change while leaving virtually unacknowledged that climate change is but one existential threat out of many in our state of overshoot. The report goes so far as to deny outright the relevance of population size, stating, citing a statement from the Union of Concerned scientists that, quote, a misplaced focus on population growth as a key driver of climate change conflates a rise in emissions with an increase in people rather than an increase in cars, power plants, airplanes, industries, and buildings. The implication here is that the technology and infrastructure that produce climate wrecking emissions are wielded solely by a consumer minority residing in wealthy, low fertility countries. This view entirely discounts the global reality of a rising middle class that is responsible for all that technology and infrastructures, a global consumer class that is projected to reach five billion within this decade alone. The report's view appears to assume that the billions of people living in poverty, poverty today will not seek to improve their standard of living and thus increase their share in, quote, cars, power plants, airplanes, industries, and buildings. Meanwhile, the ignored science behind the UN-sponsored IPCC report conclusively shows that, quote, globally, GDP per capita and population growth remained the strongest drivers of CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the last decade. Quoting the IPCC from 2022, so uh, in, anyway, uh, I stand corrected. So uh, the IPCC uh, is calling GDP per capita and population growth the strongest drivers of CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the last decade. So good on the IPCC, but of course that was nowhere mentioned in the study. Uh, and so what's going on now? <clears throat> I just can't believe my battery uh, has not crashed. 
pronatalist pressures are only worsening with numerous, numerous countries spreading alarmist rhetoric about human population collapse to justify policies ranging from baby bonuses, can you say Kamala Harris paying breeders $6,000 to have a baby, and legally reduced marital age to restricting abortion and contraception, and even subsidizing the multi-billion dollar assisted reproductive technologies industries. As admitted in the report, these pronatalist policies and narratives often include ethnocentric, anti-immigration, and nationalist rhetoric that advance elitist political and economic agendas as well as religious and racist ones. These rising pronatalist trends constitute an enormous regression of hard-won human rights. Taking concrete steps to oppose them should be a priority for the UN and other bodies concerned with strengthening rep reproductive rights, yet the UN gives only passing attention to these emergent trends, prioritizing their insistence that population size and growth bear no relevance to nature protection or human rights and well being. And I'm going to read one more paragraph and you can take it from here. Ironically, realistic acknowledgement of how demographic trends fuel major social and ecological challenges would in no way interfere with the UN stated priority of strengthening female rights and autonomy. Across the world, in country after country, once women achieve the education, empowerment, and means to plan their families, fertility declines. Uh, of course, you know me, I would say ain't going to happen. Uh, I'm all for it, but it, but it ain't going to happen. It's not enough to, you know, to save the planet. But anyway, um, very, uh, uh, okay, well, all right. Providing the means for women to control their fertility, while also providing science-based information about how procreation relates to climate, biodiversity, clean water, and other environmental concerns will support women to realize their latent desire for fewer well-cared-for children and also port their decision if they so choose to remain child free. Such a shift toward female empowerment would correct for millennia of patriarchal pronatalism that has pressured women to be breeding machines. Uh, Refusal to admit the enormous implications of population size and growth suggests that the UN espouses the pronatalist forces it turns a blind eye to, despite passing mention of the influence of pronatalist pressure, the report assumes to motherhood to be a woman's desired natural path and reinforces this assumption with examples of remorseful women foregoing motherhood, those childless cat ladies, because of the climate crisis or through selective studies highlighting involuntary childlessness 
due to infertility or other circumstances. Uh, anyway, and this goes on and on, uh, and it's a very good uh, opening uh, discussion of overshoot, uh, as I say, borrowing heavily from William Reese. I've been on a William Reese binge all day, as you might have seen in my last video. Ecologist William Reese boils down saving the planet to four words. It ain't gonna happen. Anyway, guys, uh, I need to go check on uh, tonight at Bugs in a Jar is my first wedding night. Uh, these people, the happy couple, were supposed to be here at 6.30. It is now after 10 o'clock, and I don't know where the happy couple is. Uh, so we might have some uh, pronatalism going on at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Wouldn't that be hilarious? If a, uh, if a future child is being spawned uh, right now at Bugs in a Jar Farm while I'm having this rant. Um, that would be ironic. If, uh, if Bugs in a Jar Farm uh, becomes a breeding colony uh, with all of this going on here. That truly would be funny. Anyway, I'm going to go see if I can check to go see if the happy couple found their way to Bugs in a Jar Farm. Bye, guys. Where is the happy couple, Sancho? I don't give a damn about the happy couple. I just want to sleep.